Good morning. Welcome to the Christian Life Center. My name is Caitlin Cellini, and I have the privilege of welcoming you to church this morning um, and helping to lead our family worship. So um, I'll be doing some motions up here to the first song, and we just encourage all of you, kids, adults, um, to stand with us, to sing, to worship um, in the way that you feel most comfortable. So you can follow me with emotions. You can sing. You can stand. You can raise your hands wherever you feel led. So please stand with us. Let's worship God this morning.
before us and the world behind us until we remember that we do it because you are better than anything that the world can offer us. And so God, today, we just pray that in our hearts as we receive your word, that we'd be reminded to choose better, that we have an invitation to join you, but it's our invitation to accept. And so, God, if there's anything in our lives today, and for each one of us, I'm sure there's at least one thing that we choose over you, not intentionally, God, but just in the day-to-day things, we choose it, and we think it's better, and it's not. And so, God, today, I just pray that we would just remember that you are beyond all things. We want to sit at your table with you today. We want to worship you We want you to be glorified in all things because you're more than better, God. You're the greatest thing we could ever have. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to the Christian Life Center. We are so glad that you are joining us today. My name is Ben, and kids, you are officially dismissed. You can make your way into Kid Zone. That is for all of our Kid Zone students and our middle school students. You can make your way into Kid Zone. If you're coming from the balcony or the parking lot, you can just make your way to the main Kid Zone doors. There'll be somebody there. If you do have a preschooler, we ask parents you go with just to make sure that they get to the right spot. But you are officially dismissed, and you can make your way there. Like I said, my name is Ben. I want to say welcome to the Christian Life Center. If this is your first time with us, we want to kind of give you a special shout out and say we would love the opportunity to get to know you just a little bit more. Two ways we want to encourage you to get to know you a little bit more. Number one, if you go to our website, clcfamily.church slash connect, there you will find a connection card. It's something that you can fill out, kind of digitally submit your information. You can ask any questions that you have, and it's the easiest way for us to get in contact with you. Uh, If you prefer a paper version at the end of the service in the main lobby, also out at the CLC Kids entrance. There'll be somebody there with an actual paper version of that. So if you want to do that, that's fine. Or if you want to, one of the next steps you could do is to join us on Wednesdays for what we call Connect on Wednesday. Basically at 5.30, we share a meal together. 6.30, there's classes for kids, for adults, uh, for students. There's a ton of different things. And it's just a simple on-ramp for you to get connected, come on out, meet some new people, and it should be a lot of fun. So we would love the opportunity to get to know you a little bit more by the Connect card or just by coming out to cow. There is some things that we want to draw to your attention for today and let you know about in the weeks to come. The first is that today is a communion Sunday. So if you are at home specifically, we want to encourage you that if you want to join us in that, that you would prepare for that. So grab something uh, for the juice and for the crackers because we will be partaking in that towards the end of the service. So if you want to be a part of that, you can even pause this if you're watching online, go grab that and then hit play and we'll still be here. Uh, But we would love for you to be a part of that 
that for us. If you're in person, you should have received that as you made your way on in. If not, please talk to one of the ushers or one of the staff and we will get you the uh, the products or the it, products. It's not a thing. We're not selling anything. <laughs> we can get you the communion cups that you need. So we are taking communion today. Uh, another couple things that we want to let you know about is that the Kid Zone could really use some help, specifically on Wednesday nights at the Kids Connect during our cow time, as well as on Sunday mornings. Obviously, with the transition with Jeanette coming up, there is some gaps that we are trying to fill, and just in the world that we live in, volunteerism is down. So if you would be willing to step up, we could absolutely use your help. You could see Megan, our children's director, for more information, and she will get you kind of plugged into the right spot. She'll get you where you need to go and give you any information that you're looking for. So we'd like you to do that as well. Also, our pastoral nominating committee, the PNC, has been hard at work. They had a meeting on September 24th, and we do want to let you know that they have an update, and they're going to try and do a weekly update in our weekly newsletter that we put out on Friday. So if you go to the most recent newsletter, you can see the most current up-to-date information that the PNC is putting out there and where they're at in that process. So they want to try and communicate well, so that is what they're going to try and do. So I want to encourage you to go to clcfamily.church slash news and you'll see the most recent newsletter where you can get more information on that. Two other quick things is that our Fall Fest is coming up. We're pretty excited for this. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be on October 16th. There's a car show and bike show. Uh, there's going to be inflatables. There's going to be games. It's going to be a whole lot of fun that we would love for you and your family, your friends, your neighbors to be a part of if you're interested in doing that. You can help out. There's a sign up for that on the uh, web page or if you just want to be a part of it, you can do that as well. But we are pretty excited and hyped for it. So we want you to save the date, October 16th. It goes from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Our rain date is, I believe, the 23rd. But mark your calendars. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you want to help, that would be awesome to have you help for that as well. And then the last thing that I'll just let you know before we turn it over to Christian for week three of the parable series is that we are returning for the month of October is what we are calling game days. Basically, when the Eagles play during the month of October on Sunday afternoons at one o'clock, we are going to show those in our parking lot. Generally, it's just a lot of a lot of fun, kind of a down, really chill time. There's usually kids that are running around in the parking lot with bikes and sports equipment and outdoor equipment. It's really just an excuse to hang out together. So if you would be interested in doing that, actually today is the very first game day. So that is at uh, October 3rd at 1 p.m. We've got October 10th at 1 p.m. and then October 31st at 1 p.m. Those are our three scheduled game days. So if you would like to be a part of that, all you got to do is show up in the parking lot. You can't miss it. It's the big screen where you'll see the Eagles game. So that is kind of all the announcements we have. Uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christian, who is going to do week three of our Parables series. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a great week. All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? Good, good. I know uh, the Eagles are playing today, so I'm sure half of us are super anxious and half of us are awkwardly optimistic that something good will happen today. Um, but either way, we're so, so glad to have you guys here, as Ben said. My name's Christian, and I'm on staff here. And before we jump in today, I actually did want to reiterate something that was in the announcement video for you all today. Um, so the kids' ministry does a phenomenal job at what they do, uh, especially with things kind of picking back up or doing Wednesday nights again. What we found is that the need for volunteers is greater than it's ever been. I always tell my high school volunteers, because I oversee, I oversee the high school ministry, I always tell them that it really does take a team of people who love Jesus and can love students well to help them encounter the love of Jesus. And so that's what we're looking for in the kids' ministry. And you heard Ben reference it briefly. I think a lot of uh, people already know. Um, but uh, it was announced last week, actually, that Jeanette Gilbert, who's been serving so faithfully for the last seven years, has made the decision to step down as our family's ministry uh, director uh, to kind of have a new start. And so with that, our need for volunteers is greater than it's ever been. So we're not inviting you to just fill a role. We're not inviting you to babysit. That's the furthest thing from the truth. What we're inviting people into is to help create a space for young congregants to encounter the love of Jesus. And so if you're interested in that, or if you want to learn more, because I know sometimes I get anxious to just sign up immediately. So if you want to learn more, uh, go ahead and just talk to Megan. She could answer any question that you have, and I'm sure she'd love to get you plugged into that. Is that all right? Awesome. Let me go ahead and pray for the Kids Zone ministry real quick and the Kids Zone team. So if you would, pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so, so much for our Kids Zone team. We thank 
you so much for Jeanette and the, the seven years that she's just poured into these kids. Some of it who, who are in the, the middle school and high school ministry now, some who have graduated and are in life right now. We just thank you that the, for the work that she uh, has done here in her time here. We pray for the kids' ministry. As, uh, as they continue to do incredible things that you would just provide people to help fill those roles. Not, again, not to babysit, not to watch kids, but to show them the love of Jesus and to help teach them about who you are. And so, God, we know that you're faithful. Uh, we pray that you just have your way with this and that you would be glorified in all of it. And we pray this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Uh, also, there's always a lot happening at the CLC. Y'all know that. Uh, ben talked a lot, didn't he? Uh, talked a lot about a lot of the things that we have going on. If you ever want to learn more about that, I just want to remind you, we do have a newsletter that goes out every week. Megan Graff does a phenomenal job at pulling that together uh, with everything else that she's doing at the church. Uh, and so if you want to check that out or sign up for that, you can go to clcfamily.church slash news. All right, I'm done with the announcements. Uh, I want to tell you guys a story. We're in week three of parables which parables are just short stories with great meaning, right? So we're in week three of the series, and I figured let me start with a story about some prominent figures eating dinner together with an awkward conversation. Because we all love awkward conversations, right? I don't. We do not like awkward conversations, so I wanted to share a story with y'all today. So it was December 2019. My dad and I were uh, graciously invited by one of his friends to see the Philadelphia Eagles play the Dallas Cowboys. Now, I, I just wanted to insert a comment here and say, this is not a time to talk about last week's game. I'm talking about the Cowboys. This is not a time to reflect on that. In fact, Scripture says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So from that vantage point, the Eagles are doing really well right now. Can I get an amen, right? Uh, the Eagles are doing phenomenal, right? Uh, so anyway, we're invited to this Eagles game, and it's a suite, right? And so the first thing I think about, I get so excited about this. The first thing I think about is the buffet, right? It's not the incredible view we're going to have. It's not the accessible bathroom. It's not the valet parking. It's the buffet, right? And so we're gearing up. Uh, we're, we pull up to the stadium, and here's actually a picture of my dad and I. I think we'll get it. There it is. Here's a picture of my dad and I at this Eagles game when uh, the, Philly, the, the Eagles actually did beat the Cowboys. I'm sure some of you were curious. But we're at the Eagles game. We pull up. The valet takes our car, and we walk up. And we walk into the suite. And there's two things that immediately catch my attention. The first thing is the buffet, right? You got grilled chicken. You got Philly pretzels. You got like the veggie tray for the healthy people, right? You got uh, what? There was salmon. There was so much salmon at this buffet. And that's the first thing that caught my attention. The second thing that caught my attention were some of the people in the suite that we would actually be watching the game with that day. And the first person that caught my attention was actually Julie Ertz. You all know who Julie Ertz is. She is a world-renowned, you can see in the picture here, she's the kind of bottom right there, second from the right, uh, with the blonde hair. It's Julie Ertz. Uh, she's a world-renowned soccer player, professional soccer athlete. She played in the Olympics this last year. And then, of course, we all know her. Um, she's the wife of Zach Ertz, who is the Eagles' tight end, right? And so there she is sitting in the suite. And the next person that I noticed who's also in this picture is uh, there was Zach Ertz, his three brothers, and his mom. And so right next to Julie in this photo, that's uh, Zach's mom. So I got to talk with her and say hi to her and kind of talk with the brothers just to say I talked with the brothers, right? Uh, and so I got to kind of meet the Ertz family and talk with them a little bit. Uh, and then the third person that I, that I noticed that I saw is this guy who's sitting right next to me and he was begging to take a photo during the whole game. And this is who it is. This is uh, Brian Westbrook. He, wasn't, he didn't know me. He wasn't begging to take a photo. But it's Brian Westbrook who's the former running back of the Eagles. And so here I am in this suite with these incredible, uh, incredible giants in the football world and just these incredible athletic professionals, right? And so I'm trying to keep my cool, right? Because there's a buffet here, and I told you guys I like the buffet, right? And so during the game, I was constantly going to the buffet. 
I looked like a fool. And the thing that I was getting the most was salmon. It should be illegal how much salmon I ate that night, guys. And so I'm getting salmon, plate after plate, trying not to look ridiculous in front of these people. And so I go up and I'd say, this one's for my dad. Like my dad just loves salmon. He's eating a lot. I'll tell him to calm down, right? And so I go back and eat this salmon. And so I'm just sitting at this kind of the bar top watching the game, eating my salmon, texting some buddies like, you won't believe who's in the suite with me. And I'm shoving salmon down my gullet. And, uh, and, I, and I'm texting them. And one of my friends texts me back. And he says, oh, my gosh, Julie Ertz is there. Our friend's daughter loves soccer and loves Julie Ertz. And so I was like, let me see if I can get an autograph, right? And so what happens is I have to wait for the right moment because I guess she's like watching her husband play football or something. And so I'm trying to wait for the right moment when Julie is not preoccupied with the game. And so I wait for, you know, what appears to be a commercial. And then I go up, kind of, she was sitting in the chair that you saw. I go up and kind of kneel next to her and say, hey, Julie, big fan of yours. Hey, could I get an autograph for a friend of, a friend of mine? His daughter is a huge soccer player, huge soccer fan. Could I get your autograph. And I grabbed, I didn't have anything to sign. I grabbed like a magazine with an Eagles player on the front. So it didn't even make any sense. But I hand it to her. I'm like, can you please sign this? And then she turns to me and she says, okay, what's her name? <laughs> and I just kind of had this moment where literally I just like stared at her. Like I was like, I don't know her name. Like, I don't know her name. And so I had this awkward moment. I started eventually, like a normal person, I responded to her question. And I started talking. But there was a moment. It was so awkward. I was just staring at Julie Ertz. I'm like, I have no clue what her name is. And so I was like, I can go, like, make a phone call and get her name real quick. I don't know it. And the temperament of the conversation changed dramatically. She, like, no longer looked at me. She just signed the magazine and kind of, like, handed it over like this. So I grab the magazine and I go back to my dad. I'm like, dad, I think I just upset Julie Ertz. And uh, what we suspected uh, was that maybe she thought we were just getting like her autograph to sell it or something. And so Julie and Zach, if you're watching this, I promise it was authentic. We had someone that we gave that to. But we were laughing about it and I still had my salmon, so I was okay, right? But this was a really weird, awkward exchange, right? It was so awkward and uncomfortable. And today, the passage that we're working through is a story of Jesus with some prominent figures over dinner having some difficult and awkward conversations. Now, let me warn you, because maybe you didn't feel as awkward as I did when I was in that moment just screwing everything up, right? But this passage is not going to let us off the hook. This passage might draw us in, and we might feel the tension and the difficulty of it. And I encourage you, and I challenge you, don't shrink back, but lean in, and let's see what God has for us in this today. Does that sound okay? And so we're in this passage today. Uh, it is the parable of the great banquet, and it is a difficult interaction over dinner with some of the community's most prominent figures. And y'all know me, you, you know that I like to kind of share a little bit about the context of what's going on so we can better understand this passage. When we understand the context, I kind of tell students, like you don't watch five minutes of a movie and then try and draw a conclusion about what that movie was about. You got to understand the whole picture here. And so when we look at the context, we're going to look at the whole picture. And so we're in the book of Luke. We've been in this book for like a year and a half now, right? And the book of Luke does something really intentionally. It tries to paint a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's Jesus teaching and Luke writing these things down to paint a picture of what we can expect the kingdom of heaven to be like. And when I say kingdom of heaven, I'm not referring to something that's just far off in the future that one day we will inherit, but it's actually something that we can inherit and experience today. When they said the kingdom of heaven, in fact, in Luke 17, he writes, the kingdom of heaven is where? It's in your midst. And so there's something about the kingdom of heaven that, yes, we do inherit it more fully one day, but there's something about it that we can experience it today. And our passage is going to talk about that. The metaphor that I kind of thought of with this is like, remember when the Eagles won the Super Bowl? How can we forget, right? Great year. Uh, the Eagles won the Super Bowl, right? They had the victory. They were victorious. 
but there's still a period of time of waiting until they could have the full celebration with the parade, right? They were victorious. No one was going to take that victory away. They had that victory, but there's this in-between time that we as fans were waiting to experience the parade, to experience the culmination of this victory in that celebration, right? And so in the meantime, we're buying our Eagles gear, the new gear that comes out with the Super Bowl stuff, right? We're purchasing that. We are getting ready for this celebration, and we're inviting people along to join us, right? That's what we're doing. And so the kingdom of heaven is a lot like that. We have victory. What Christ did is finished. We have victory, right? And we were just singing about that. But we're kind of in this weird phase where we were waiting for the culmination of the celebration, right? We're waiting for God to establish his kingdom once and for all in fullness. And so what do we do in the meantime? Let's get ready for it. Let's celebrate. Let's sing. Let's invite people along. And let's usher in the culture of this celebration. Let's usher in the culture of the kingdom. And so I say the culture of the kingdom. Christian, what is that? That's what Luke, his objective is to teach people about the culture of the kingdom so that we can live in it today. So that we can give people a taste of the kingdom of God today. Because we are already victorious. And we are preparing people for the parade, right? And so that's what's happening in this story. So we have in-between tasks. Scripture is very clear and gives us tasks that we do in the meantime as we are preparing for this parade, as we are preparing for God to fully establish his kingdom, right? And so the book of Luke is actually a litany of concrete demonstrations of what we as Christians can do in this in-between period. The book of Luke gives us very clear ideas of what it looks like to live in the kingdom today, right? And so that's what we're going to work through today. Uh, As you know, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, right? In the book of Luke, this is where we're at. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and we all know what happens in Jerusalem. He's crucified. He dies, and he comes back to life, right? And so we understand that it's crunch time. Like if you know you are venturing towards your death, you are going to make the most of every opportunity you get. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he is teaching unapologetically. Like he is just calling people out and he is teaching. And so on his way to Jerusalem, he makes a stop at this house of the Pharisee and he's sharing a meal with them, right? And we've been talking about this meal for the past couple of weeks. In fact, Ben talked about it last week. And he talked about this awkward moment when Jesus kind of called out the guests, right? And he says, you guys are obsessed over pride and your status. And he was kind of critiquing their social and cultural norms of where you sit at the dinner table, right? And so these people at the dinner were just obsessed with their pride, obsessed with their status. And so Jesus calls them out. And I did want to apologize I don't have those like G.I. Joe action figure dolls this week, so I'm not going to be using those. So if you're looking for that today, I'm terribly sorry. You can check out last week's sermon where Ben kind of uses those. So I did want to mention that. Um, But today, Jesus continues his critique. He actually turns his attention from the guests to someone else. And earlier I said, we're not off the hook. We're not off the hook with this passage because if you look at the context, Jesus is speaking with Pharisees and religious leaders. And in that time, they were part of what was known as the retainer class, which means that they were probably middle to upper class religious people of their day. And so if Jesus, if we're looking at this passage, if Jesus was here today teaching this passage, we would be his audience. Generally speaking, we would most likely be the people that he's teaching this to. And again, I don't want us to shrink back. I want us to lean in to see what God has for us in this. Does that sound all right? Y'all can talk in church. It's okay. I won't call you out. Sometimes when my high school students talk, I do got to call them out. But y'all can chat all you want. It's okay. Uh, So we're going to start in Luke 14, verse 12. And we find ourselves in the middle of an awkward confrontation and conversation over dinner with some prominent people. Here it is. Verse 12, he said also to the man who had invited him, right? He just critiqued the guest. Now he's turning his attention. He said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. Have you ever hosted someone at your house? I hope, this, I hope you've not experienced this. Have you ever hosted someone at their house and then they start coaching you on how to host people at your house, 
right? Here Jesus is at a dinner party, and he turns to his host, and he's like, this is how you can be a better host. I'm tempted to believe that if Jesus were here today, we might not want to invite him to our dinner parties, right? Because he would just call us out, and that is what's happening right here. He turns his attention to the man who had invited him, the man who had included him, and he turns around to the host and says, when you give a a dinner banquet, you know, a lot like the one you're hosting right now. When you give a dinner banquet, don't just invite your rich friends, people you have close relationships with, people that you like to be around. Don't just invite them. And I have to clarify here, I don't think Jesus is trying to tell us right now, hey, CLC, don't ever host a family function or anything where the people you like are there. That's not what Jesus is saying, but rather what I think Christ is saying when, our, when, you, when we gather, as we make a practice of that throughout life, don't just invite these people. Extend your reach. Bring someone else in, right? And so he's saying don't just invite these people, but bring in someone else. And so I have to ask the question, why is that? Like, why can't I just always invite these people that I like to be around? Remember, we got to remember what's going on. Jesus is painting a picture, and Luke, they're painting a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is is like. And do we remember the conversation they ha- that we had last week here where Jesus was critiquing these people for being so obsessed with their pride and their status, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand and that's what you're worried about. You're worried about how other people will perceive you, how you kind of rank in this social order. And if you invite rich people, you know, there's no better way to bolster your status and your pride than if you invite rich people then you invite these famous people, these prominent figures in the community. And so Jesus is teaching them. He's saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't just invite people who bolster your pride. Don't just invite people who help elevate your status. Okay, Jesus, then who are we supposed to invite, right? If we're not inviting the the CEO or the person who can give us a raise or or the person who can give us a promotion, status, money, materials, or the person who can invite us to their fancy banquets, then who are we supposed to include? And so it continues. Don't invite the rich. In verse 13 it says, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So here he's saying, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the, the lame and the blind. These are people who had no social capital to gain or to give. To the religious community of the day, this would have been people that were marginalized, that, they, that were ceremonially unclean. And so they would have not interacted with these people. And so here Jesus is pushing back against that. He's saying, invite them in. Dine with them. Share space with them. Watch Netflix with them. Talk about the game with them. Invite them in and share space with them. And then he says, and you'll be blessed. Why? Because they can't pay you back. Because you gain nothing in return. No social status, no fame, no money. Invite them in and you'll be blessed. I don't know about you, but when I read this passage, I'm like, okay, like Jesus, you tell me I'm going to be blessed, but I don't see the blessing. Like, where's the blessing in that? Like, if I'm going out to Chick-fil-A with my friends and I'm paying for all of them, I don't feel blessed, right? Um, what he's saying here, or actually, let me, let me share a little bit about this. Um, one of my professors talked about this a lot. She, she talked about this concept of blessing and how blessing actually in the first century was something totally different than what we think about today. When we think of the word blessing today, we think of something that the first century Christians would not have thought about, right? And what she was saying is we actually have a, in the 21st century, we almost have a narrow or a smaller view of what blessings are, right? I think we've reduced this idea of blessing to, you know, those moments when we might experience financial or material gain, right? Or maybe when our circumstances are going really well. 
We, we've heard the sayings like, I'm blessed, right? Or I'm too blessed to be stressed. You ever heard that one, right? Uh, and it's not, don't get me wrong. It's not a bad thing to, to identify that, yeah, we are blessed. But what my professor is saying, and what I think we're seeing in this passage, is that our view of blessing is just too narrow. It is just too small, right? Because Jesus says, you will be blessed. Why? Because they can't pay you back. And so the question that we're all probably thinking is, okay, Jesus, then where's the blessing, right? You'll be blessed because your heart is bent towards generosity. You'll be blessed because in a world that obsesses over personal, social, and monetary gain, your heart will be bent towards humility and compassion. You're blessed because in a world of egocentrism, your heart is bent towards empathy and graciousness towards the neglected. The best and most rare commodity of all is a heart and a life that reflect the heart and life of Jesus. And so when your life can reflect that, you are blessed because you possess, possess something that not many people have. You've acquired something so much better than money, so much better than fame, and so much better than status. And so you are blessed because they can't pay you back. Because you don't get money, because you do not get fame, because you do not get these things. But it's interesting because in the passage, of course, says, For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. <laughs> What's the resurrection of the just? Like, no one's hanging out at Thanksgiving saying, Hey, so are you excited about the resurrection of the just? <laughs> right? No one's talking about that. So the resurrection of the just, what is that? So this is language we do not hear a lot. Uh, just in the Greek is diakos, which is the same word for righteousness. And where do we get righteousness? By faith in Jesus alone. And how is our faith proven? It's through a changed and transformed heart, right? Through our lives. And so here Jesus is saying, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Meaning, if your life and your heart reflects the life and heart of Jesus, if you are experiencing that transformation, you will be able to pretend, uh, attend the resurrection of the just. And so he's saying, you're going to be repaid. And it's not going to be in money. In fact, on this side of the sun, you're not going to experience any of the immediate blessing of this, but hold out hope because the best is yet to come. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. If we have faith that is evidenced by a transformed heart, faith that is evidenced by how we engage with our neighbor, right? Then we'll experience the resurrection of the just. Y'all following me? We good? So... <laughs> What do you say after that? Like, if you're Jesus and you're just calling out the host, like, how do you bounce back from that type of conversation? You say, man, this unleavened bread is incredible, right? Is that sea salt I taste? How do you bounce back from such an awkward and difficult conversation, right? Because things are really awkward in the room. And guess what? It actually gets a lot worse. Like, it's kind of comical reading this now. It gets a lot worse. The next, uh, the next passage continues in verse 15. When one of you who reclined at the table, sorry, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, right? Have you ever had an argument with a loved one and uh, you wanted to shut the argument down really quickly? Like maybe it's like 10 o'clock at night, which for some reason is when most arguments happen, right? It's like 10 o'clock at night, and you're like, I don't want to be fighting now. I have an early morning at work. And you try and say the one thing that you think will shut the conversation down, but it actually has the opposite effect, right? Like the two, the two words that we should never utter, calm down, right? Anyone been there, right? Uh, we say those words, and it has the opposite effect because now, you know, the rage is flying through the roof, right? Uh, here in this moment, Jesus is critiquing the host. And all the guests are listening in, right? They're all there. They're all watching this unfold. And so one of the guests chimes in, and he says something that has the opposite effect of what he wants. Because he feels the tension, and he feels the awkwardness. And so what he does is he says this kind of pious, polished, religious sentiment. Like, oh, blessed is everyone who's going to taste the banquet, who's going to eat the bread in the kingdom of heaven. 
But there's a couple problems with this statement. The first of them being, his intention wasn't to add to the conversation, but his intention was to shut it down. Because it was awkward. And he didn't want Jesus to continue grilling the host. And so he's like, Jesus, yeah, you're right. You know, blessed is everybody who will taste uh, of the bread of the kingdom of heaven, right? And the second issue is this. Is, I mean, he's right. That's, that's, a, that's a true statement. Blessed is everyone who will sit at that table and experience the parade, right? The celebration. However, the problem is, is the guy who said it and the people around him don't truly believe that. Because here they are at a table and they've neglected to include a lot of people. And this was practice. This was normal to them. They didn't associate with people who were non-Jew, or in that time we know them as the Gentiles, right? They neglected them. They didn't associate people with people who were ceremonially unclean, and so they rejected them. And so here this guy's almost paying lip service, saying, blessed are those or everyone who will eat this bread in the kingdom of heaven. But then by practice, they're practicing the very opposite thing. They are excluding people. And right, this is in response to Jesus' invitation to include people, right? And so it's hilarious because his intention to shut Jesus down actually has the opposite effect. Like the reason why we have the parable of the great banquet is because this guy spoke up, right? And I'm sure his like buddies were like kicking him under the table. Like, why do you have to say that? Because Jesus takes this opportunity to share with us the parable of the great banquet, which is the parable that we are in today. And this is how the parable starts in verse 16. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. So here in this parable, we have this, this leader and this servant. And this guy, this host is throwing a party. He is throwing not just any banquet. He is throwing a great banquet banquet. In fact, I was curious about what that meant. So I looked up the word great, great in Greek, and I kid you not, it's mega. He's hosting a mega banquet, y'all. He's hosting a great banquet, and the, uh, what, what the definition said is the Greek word actually uh, means uh, that it is larger. It is large in the widest sense. So the greatest banquet that you can think of, this is the great, the mega banquet, the banquet of all banquets. They're going to have Philly pretzels. They're going to have salmon. They're going to have veggie trays for the healthy people, right? They're going to have everything. It is a mega banquet, and this guy's throwing it. And he's saying, hey, go invite people. Bring people in. Welcome them, right? And so in Jewish tradition, it was custom to send out two invitations. And the first one was like an RSVP of sorts, right? They would go out and say, hey, we're having a party on this day. Do you want to come? It's a plus one. You can bring your friend, right? They're, they're, they're throwing this party, and they would try and get a head count, right? They would try and figure out how many people definitely are coming, kind of like wedding invites today. You know weddings are expensive, and so you want people to RSVP if they're going to be there or not because— they don't have giant then, so they can't just go to the store and buy all the food they need, right? They can't have someone cater this mega banquet. So what they do is they need a head count because then they got to go to the field and slaughter the animals. They got to go to the field and gather the grain. They got to let the wine ferment so it is ready for this mega banquet. And so this first invite was to figure out exactly how many people were coming so they prepared enough food for those at the table, right? And then the second invite's not really an invite, it's more of a notification, right? Like the notifications we get on your phone, right? When you're being seated at a restaurant and it's saying, hey, your table is ready, right? This is that type of notification. So the servant goes out again and he says, hey, the mega banquet's ready. The food is ready. We've done all the work. We've done all of the preparation. This party is about to begin, right? And so they are ready to feast and they are ready to dine. The table is set you are welcome to come, right? So the passage continues. <clears throat> Verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot 
So this mega banquet is ready, y'all. I mean, they had already RSVP'd, and this mega banquet is ready. Then one by one, they systematically decline to come. They come up with excuses, and they do not attend this mega banquet. And they were all really lame excuses, right? Like the first one, the field. Back in that day, I mean, even today, if you buy property, that is a very big purchase. And so they would, it's not like they're showing up sight unseen because they saw it on Zillow. No, they would have examined this purchase well beforehand. So he knows what his field looks like. He doesn't need to examine it instead of this great banquet, right? Uh, the second thing is oxen. Same with the oxen. So oxen would have been considered like a car purchase or like when you're buying tractor machinery for your farm. That would have been a big deal. So they would have already examined the oxen well before they made the purchase, right? And then the last one uh, with the wife. There are, there are one of two things going on here. One, he's either got a huge honey-do list that is unfinished, and, and, and that's a really good excuse, actually. Um, but second and more likely is actually in that time, uh, he was, he was kind of pulling this excuse that you could find in Deuteronomy, which says if you're newly married, you can kind of avoid the draft uh, for the first year of marriage. Or you can avoid war. You can avoid certain jobs or tasks, right? And so he's kind of employing this exemption from Deuteronomy 24. He's like, hey, oh, sorry, she was just married, and so I'm free for a year, not going to this mega banquet, right? And so they all gave different lame excuses, but all these excuses do have a commonality. They're not bad things, right? These things are they're good things. These aren't terrible things, right? But what they had in common as well is that each of them esteemed this thing, this good thing, is better than the great thing. These good things as better than the mega thing, right? And we do this, you know, we, we do this today where we prioritize things. Not a bad thing, but we prioritize sometimes the good things over the great things. So it could be marriage, our property, our houses, jobs, career, success, safety, money, security, grades, sports, college, entertainment, and accolades, right? These things are not inherently bad. However, when we take good things and we miss out on the great things that God are invi is inviting us to, then they become bad things, right? When we take good things and we prioritize them over the best things, over what Christ is inviting us into, then they are no longer good. Because you see, Christ is inviting these people, he's inviting all of us to experience this mega banquet, this kingdom of heaven living, to participate in it, not just in the future, but today. And so, how do we respond to the invitation? We prioritize things that held next to the kingdom of God are trivial, right? And I'm guilty of this. I'm speaking to myself. I'm guilty of this. We prioritize things that held next to the kingdom of God are trivial. We prioritize things that a hundred years from now will not matter in the slightest, right? And so we have, ought to ask ourselves, why, why did they come up to the, the servant and say, actually, this is why I'm not going? Like, why did they come up with these excuses? What was the objective of that, right? And it could be a couple things. First of them being, there's no promise of gain, Right? There's no promise of any status, of any money, repayment, or personal gain, right? They asked the question, what's in it for me? And they looked at this mega banquet, and they're like, I mean, I like food and all, but there's no promise of promotion, so I got to tend to my field. Got to cut the grass. Sorry, right? One professor says it this way, that the kingdom of God had not by any means the first place in their esteem. They were men who talked much about the kingdom of heaven— yet cared little for it, who were very religious yet very worldly, a class of which too many specimens exist in every age. Ouch. Remember, these are people who said yes, right? There's not really an excuse there. They said yes to the initial invitation. They said, I will be there. Please prepare a plate for me. Pour a little extra wine. I plan to show up that day, right? And so they said yes with their lips. But then when it came time to actually show up to the party, 
They bailed. They took good things and said, this is better than the greatest thing. And they misprioritized, right? We are a fickle people, so concerned with good things that we miss out on the greatest things, right? C.S. Lewis writes about it this way. He's one of my favorite authors. If you've seen any of the Narnia movies or read the books, he's the author of those books. And he writes this. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. So here we are in this parable. These individuals are taking good things and they are misprioritizing them and missing out on the best thing, right? So the parable continues. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in who? The poor and crippled and blind and lame. He's angry. I don't know if it's because a lot of people gave him lip service, right? Like, have you ever invited a bunch of people to something? They're like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll be there. And then they don't show up. You kind of get a little frustrated, right? So he could be angry at their lip service or because them not showing up insults his generosity and his graciousness in some ways, right? And so what do they do? What do they do now? He's like, go invite more people. Go to the, la- the lanes in the city. Invite the very people that you guys are refusing to invite to your banquet, right? The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now remember, all of this parable is in response to that one thing that the one guy said to shut down the conversation, but it had the opposite effect, right? It's all in response to the man who said, blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. In response to this statement, Jesus is communicating that some of the religious people think they will experience the mega banquet, but they're merely paying lip service. Like, how can you experience the mega banquet if you just decide not to show up, (laughs) right? How can you experience the mega banquet if you just make excuses and you don't actually attend? How can you experience the mega banquet if you prioritize the wrong things, like personal gain, status, and fame? How can you experience it if when the time comes, you pick everything else but this banquet? And so what Christ is saying is, hey, Some of these people are probably better poised to experience this mega banquet than you are. Some of these people in the city, in the lane, those that you exile, those that you do not share space with, they are more poised because they're not obsessed with status and fame like you guys are. They're not obsessed with these, these good things that you prioritize as the greatest thing. And so guess what? Let's bring them into the party. Let's celebrate with them. And he's sharing this with people uh, who excommunicated them. They would have been baffled hearing that these individuals were invited to this party. And I do want to clarify, I don't think this is like, this isn't Jesus' plan B. He's not like, oh, when they screw up, then I'll invite them. What I think he's trying to paint a picture of is His whole plan, always and forever, is that everyone is invited. But he's really in this moment, since it's a parable, he's trying to teach to the ignorance and the pride of the people at this dinner, right? And so, he says, go out to the lanes in the city and bring these people in. Because they're not obsessed with status like you guys are. So the passage continues. And the servant said, sir, what you've commanded has been done. And still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house might be filled. And so they did this. They went out to the city and the lanes and they invited people in, but there's still room, which implies that maybe a lot of people RSVP'd but didn't show up. Because they're bringing all these people in and there's still room at the table. There's still food to be eaten. So go out to the hedges and the highways and bring people in. And the people that Jesus is speaking to would have known exactly who he's talking about at the hedges and the highways. Because you see, the, uh, most often, the Gentiles or the non-Jews lived outside of the city. These were the people that Jews would never, ever, ever associate with. They would never engage with them. And here Jesus is saying, go out and invite them in. Bring them into the party. Because in the kingdom of heaven, everyone is invited. 
everybody is included, right? God includes the people that we might be tempted to neglect, right? So who would this be today? If we had to, you know, go 21st century on this parable and kind of translate it to help us understand our context, who might this be today? People who are experiencing homelessness? Maybe people who we don't understand? People who are politically and culturally and ethnically different than us, right? This is a banquet that welcomes and invites and embraces all people that we might be tempted to exclude. That's, that's what Jesus is communicating to them, and that's what he's inviting us to think about, right? I actually wanted to uh, share a story of a different banquet that I experienced in the city of Philly. Um, it had far less salmon and a lot more PB&J, okay? Um, and it was actually out by the highways, and hedges in that time were considered low walls. Um, and so... In college, I, uh, I participated in this ministry called the Yacht Club. Now, don't be fooled. It is not a boating club. Uh, it is an acronym for Youth Against Complacency and Homelessness Today. And so uh, I was participating in the Yacht Club, and every Thursday and Saturday, we would meet up in the coffee shop at our school, and together, just in the middle of the coffee shop, we'd make a bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, like a ton of sandwiches. Every student who would be going uh, on this outing with us, they, were, they had to make two sandwiches. They, everyone had to bring in two sandwiches, right? And so what would happen is we'd get the sandwiches, we'd load up in the vans, and we'd drive to the city, Philadelphia. Uh, and there's two locations that we went to uh, every week. It was the Free Library, um, which is right over the Vine Expressway, and we go to Love Park, which is right downtown. And we went to these two locations because each week it looked like there were populations of people experiencing homelessness who would gather in these areas. And so what we would do is we'd drive to the city, we'd hop out of the vans with our PB&J, right? And we would go up to these individuals, uh, and we'd find someone, and we would give them one sandwich, and then we would open up the other one. And we would just sit there and eat with these individuals. We get to hear their stories. We get to hear how it is that they've been struggling and what they're doing to try and get back on their feet. And we got to know them personally. Like, we got to know them by name. And we're doing this so often that each week we come back and we'd see some, some similar faces. And be like, hey, man, how are you doing? Eric, it's so good to see you. John, it's so good to see you, right? And so we'd recognize these people and make friends with them. There's one gentleman I very vividly recall. His name was Daniel. And we literally, uh, right in front of Free Library, there's the, the bridge that goes over the Vine Expressway. We, we were at the highways and the hedges, right? Because we are on over the Vine Expressway, and we meet Daniel here. Uh, and Daniel is such a cool guy. He was a big dude, but he was like a teddy bear. Um, he loved everyone, and he loved Jesus. And so we got to know Daniel, got to know his story. And then every week, he would follow us back to our vans uh, to pray with us, because we always prayed right there. We pray for everyone we met. We just pray that God would do a work in the city. Uh, we pray for the government, like all of these things. We just pray that God be in the middle of it all, right? So Daniel would come back and he'd pray with us. And then he'd kind of do, like, well, as we were loading the van, he'd close the door and kind of like pat the side of the van to like send us off or something. And every week he faithfully did that with us. And then one day, we got a phone call on campus that um, it was Daniel's family. They called to let us know that Daniel had passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. And they said, hey, we would love for you guys to come to the service. So we loaded up in my buddy's Subaru and drove to North Philly and participated in this funeral service for our friend who loved us and loved Jesus. Isn't this what God's inviting us to? Isn't this what God is inviting us to? He's painting a picture of the kingdom of heaven here, you see what ki the kingdom of heaven is on earth. And I'm not saying I do this perfectly because I don't, but isn't this what God's calling the religious folk to do in this moment? To not pay lip service, but to accept the invitation to show up and then invite others along. Bring people in. Dine with them. Celebrate with them, right? Go to the parade with them. Mourn with them. Share life with them. Do life with them. 
Jesus is painting a picture of what the kingdom of heaven will be like, and he's inviting us, right? We're in the in-between time where we have victory, but the celebration has not yet happened, right? In the in-between time, this is what he's inviting us to do, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and to share space with everybody, to include everybody, to go to the highways and the hedges and invite people in. And this is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what it looks like to participate. The parable finishes in verse 24. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. None of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Remember, this is in response to the one phrase that the guy's kicking himself for saying now. Blessed is everyone who will taste the bread of heaven. And then Jesus is saying, hey, everyone's not going to taste the bread of heaven. And I don't think it's a punishment. I don't think Jesus is saying here like, oh, you're not going to taste the bread of heaven. I don't think he's excluding them, but I think he's just making an observation. Not everyone's going to taste the bread of heaven. Why? Because we're making excuses. You've been invited, and then we even came to you and said, hey, the meal is ready. Come and eat. Come and rejoice. But then people made excuses. So Jesus is making an observation that you guys think everyone's going to taste this banquet of heaven, that everyone's going to experience the kingdom of heaven, but you're not even seeing your own lip service and your failure to do that and your own banquet. And you think you're going to participate in this, but you are prioritizing the wrong things. You're prioritizing status and fame and anything that's in it for you. And God's calling us to do the opposite, right? This is a picture of the kingdom of heaven on earth. It has little to do with the graciousness of the host, because we have a gracious host who wants to welcome in, us into this banquet and has everything to do with our prioritizing the wrong things, right? Because hear me out, Christ is gracious. He is generous, and he would love nothing more than to dine with his children, right? We see that all throughout Scripture. He wants nothing more than to invite us into this banquet and to share a space with us. But we just have a problem of putting it off, uh, putting off, those plans for our own, right? We just have a problem, and I'm guilty of this, where I prioritize my good things over the greatest things. And God is inviting us to remember the mega banquet, how fantastic this banquet will be. So the big idea is that the kingdom of heaven is here today. We can participate in this right now. And this is what it looks like to participate that we not just RSVP, but we show up. That we wouldn't merely quote some pious religious statement and quote scripture. I'm not saying scripture is not important. It is, but may not that not be the end of our faith, right? May we not just RSVP and quote some scripture, but may we actually show up. May our faith be evidenced by our very lives, right? And so with that, I want to ask a couple questions. And I'm not, expect, no one, I'm not expecting anyone to answer them. What I want you to do is to think about these questions in your own life and answer these questions in your life. What thing, good as it may be, distracts you from sp- responding to Christ's invitation today? What good things do we have in our lives that distract us from fully participating in what God would have for us today? What's our excuse? What excuses do we make? We all make them, right? What is stopping you from participating today in what God has for you? And then what are you going to do about it, right? I would encourage you, figure out what it is. Identify it and lay it down. And this is a daily task. It's not like a one and done. Like, I find for me, I, you know, it's a journey, right? We are on a journey that God is transforming us. And so, uh, every day we got to wake up and say, I need to focus on the greatest thing. I need to focus on the mega thing and remember that all these good things are secondary, right? So what is that for you and what will you do about it, right? The kingdom of heaven is in our midst. This is what it looks like to participate, that we invite others along our colleagues that we really don't like, the person by your workplace experiencing homelessness, cowboy fans, right? The widow, the prisoner, the person you disagree with, maybe someone who's wronged you. Whether it's salmon or PB&J, invite them along. Share spaces with them. 
hear each other's stories, remember each other's names, remember their kids' names, right? Share space with them, mourn with them, celebrate with them, because that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And so with that, I ask these questions. Who do you, whether incidentally or intentionally, tend to neglect? Who in your life could use the hope and sustenance of a banquet community, right? Who will you include? Invite them. Invite them. There's no shortage of people to invite. There's only a shortage at the banquet. We need to fill up this banquet space, so go invite them, right? Bring them in your home. Have a meal with them. Get to know them, right? Bring them here to church. Let them experience the love and transforming power of Christ here, right? Invite them. Because the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. It's happening now. And we, every day we're either responding to the invitation or prioritizing everything else, right? So the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. And this is what it looks like to participate. May we accept the invitation. Now, I get it. I, I think some people might... Um, read stories like this and say, well, Christian, that's kind of, that's intense. It's kind of radical, man, don't you think? That's like a little over the top, like, you know, it's just, that's a lot. But if we don't love sacrificially, right, then the kingdom of heaven will look no greater than any other banquet, right? If we don't love people radically and do some things that some people might label like radical, right, then the banquet of the kingdom of heaven, what God is doing, will look no different than any other organization or charity. Because the biggest witness to the church is people inviting people to a banquet, right? And loving people so well at that banquet. And so I think it almost has to be the gospel demands radical and sacrificial love because if we don't, we will look no different than any other organization, right? And so may we participate in the kingdom in these ways today. So I'm going to invite the band, actually, to come join us on stage. Uh, and we're going to close with a song, which I'm really excited about. But before we even get there, uh, today we get to do communion. And I cannot think of a better passage to do communion with. So today we're going to do communion. And I want to be cautious. I want, to, I, want, I want us all to be cautious, okay? May we not be like the religious guy at the table who's just going through the motions, Right? May we not be the religious guy at the table that's just going to say the polished religious statement, but may we actually participate in the kingdom and receive what God has for us today. So God has prepared a meal for us at the table, and guess what? He invites everybody. And the best part is that it's not based on your merit. The best part is it's not based on how good or how bad you've been. God is giving us the invite the same, and God's going to transform us when we come to the banquet, right? So God's giving us an invitation, and he invites us to do the same with others, not weighing their merit or how deserving anyone else is of it, because guess what? We are all not deserving of this, yet God offers it to us anyway. And so today we're going to share in that communion, that banquet meal together. So on the night which Jesus was betrayed— he was dining with his friends over a banquet. He took the bread, and he gave thanks for it, and then he broke it and offered it to everybody at the table, including Judas, right? He offered it to everyone at the table, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, and as often as you do so, do this in remembrance of me. And so you can eat the wafer at this time. After the meal, these things are really difficult to open, y'all. <laughs> there we go. So after the meal, after they were finished eating, Jesus wasn't done. He gave them another invitation. He poured the wine, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. As often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me. I'm going to pray for us real quick. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would highlight the areas in our life that we tend to prioritize over the greatest things, over the mega things, God. 
We pray that when we are tempted to build taller walls, that we might instead build longer tables and invite everybody to sit down and feast to experience your grace and your love and your compassion. We pray that we wouldn't miss out on participating in the kingdom of heaven now, that we can participate today, that we can participate in how we engage with our neighbor and friends and family and those that we may not be terribly fond of. So God, we pray that you just do a work in our heart that we might grow more into the likeness of your son and extend an invitation to everybody to experience your grace, your compassion, and your love. And as we do communion today, God, we recognize that we are most deserving, that we are most deserving of healing, of forgiveness, and of your love. And so, God, we just pray that you would transform us. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to do a really cool song. I'm really excited for it, actually. It's called At the Table. Um, I think it's by Phil Wickham, is that right? At the table? Chris Tomlin. I don't know my artist, y'all. We're doing a table, uh, song that talks about inviting people to the table and being invited to the table. God's inviting us. Are we going to accept his invitation? Will you stand and sing with us? This is Celebration Church. Amen. Church, I will feast.
Yeah, yeah let's clap for that. Yeah, thank you. What an invitation. We are invited to come as we are and participate in the kingdom today as we await the parade. And we get to invite others to join us. So with that, I challenge you guys and I encourage you every day as we wake up, what are we saying to the invitation? Will we participate today? And I hope the answer is yes. We love you guys so much. Thank you for being here. We hope that you have a phenomenal week and we will see you next week. Take care. Come all you hear, come and find his joke is